the loss of a bomber, radioactive contamination of another country's territory, the cost of decontamination, the radiation exposure of operation participants, the winding down of a large defense program, this is what happens when you throw a pillow in the wrong place. The need for airborne B-52s with atomic weapons was caused by another exacerbation of the Cold War at the turn of the 50s and 60s, as well as too much airborne flight time to Union facilities. The Americans had to keep nuclear-armed planes in the air in case of a surprise Russian strike. The first such program was Head Start. The program was proposed by General Thomas Powers, he divided it into three phases. According to the first phase, the pilots were trained at the basing airfields. In phase two, the bombers were redeployed to Bergstrom Airfield in Texas in the hope that it would be beyond the reach of Russian atomic weapons. In the final phase of the operation, the B-52s, loaded with thermonuclear weapons, flew again to Loring Airfield and from their left for a 20-hour flight around northern Canada and Greenland. Tooele is the northernmost base of the U.S. Air Force. It is located in Greenland, just 1,500 kilometers from the North Pole. It is 30 to 40 degrees below zero in the winter and about zero in the summer. Until the 1950s, only Eskimos and occasional polar explorers lived on the site of the airbase. Then the military took their place. The base was to protect America from a possible Soviet attack through the Arctic. In June 1961, the Strategic Command of the U.S. Air Force deployed a secret Operation Chrome Dome. Dozens of bombers with nuclear weapons on board patrolled the airspace over the Arctic Ocean along the 84th parallel around the clock. At a conventional signal, they had to fly to the borders of the Soviet Union to strike the first blow or a retaliatory strike. It went on like that for seven years. Hole in the Chrome Dome January 21, 1968 Flying over Thule, a B-52 Stratofortress bomber with flight number 58-0188 sends a mayday signal. The crew reports a fire and smoke in the cockpit. A few minutes later an even more disturbing code broken arrow is sent to the USA through closed communication channels it means an emergency situation with thermonuclear weapons on board. The aircraft carries for B-28FI hydrogen bombs with a yield of 1,100,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Their destructive power is based on the fusion reaction of deuterium and tritium into heavier elements. During this process, much more energy is released than in the fission chain reaction of heavy nuclei in nuclear weapons. Each bomb of the plane in distress was 70 times more powerful than the first little boy atomic bomb, with which the Americans destroyed Hiroshima in August 1945 and killed up to 200,000 people. Strata Fortress gets permission to make an emergency landing, but in a few minutes falls into North Star Bay, 11 kilometers from Thule. A strip of burning fuel 600 meters long and 100 meters wide remains on the thick sea ice. The defense system prevented the thermonuclear reaction in the bombs from starting. But the design of the charges also included conventional explosives, which detonated after hitting the surface and scattered the radioactive materials over a large area. The burning wreckage of the airplane hull melts an ice hole 50 meters in diameter, into which the uranium core of one of the bombs also falls. This is an ecological disaster and a diplomatic crisis at the same time. Greenland belongs to neutral Denmark, which declared itself a nuclear-free zone in 1957 and did not allow aircraft with nuclear weapons on board to fly through its airspace. Commander John Hogue and backup pilot Alfred Mario parachute directly into the airbase. A search party stumbles upon the body of the co-pilot in the darkness of the polar night. Leonardo Svetenko, an ethnic Ukrainian, hit the lower hatch opening mechanism while leaving the plane and died. Three other pilots were found alive. Navigator Chris Curtis spent the longest time on the ice, 21 hours, but wrapped himself in his parachute and waited for rescuers. Crested Ice An unprecedented operation to decontaminate the area and search for bomb cores, codenamed Crested Ice, begins. More than 2,500 Danish and American personnel are involved. First the responders work on snowmobiles and dog sleds. Then, from other military bases in the North Star Bay and on Tula, heavy equipment arrives, graders, excavators, trailers with showers, generators. A camp is set up, igloo huts made of ice briquettes, a helipad, a mobile power station. 
the conditions are hellish. There is a snowstorm, the temperatures sometimes dropping to minus 50 degrees, the works are being done under the light of searchlights and the glare of false flares. Dosimeters and batteries of air sampling apparatuses go out of order because of the frost. Chemical protective suits and respirators turn into icy, crispy chips workers' safety is a big issue. There is a tight quarantine around the work area, but the blizzard blows contaminated snow and ice chips outside. They are raked with graters, excavators fill the crates, and helicopters take the crates to a hopping base, where the dangerous cargo is reloaded into cisterns. The tanks are taken to the Savannah River Nuclear Burial Ground in South Carolina. Investigation The work was not completed until eight months later, by September 1968. During this time, 6.7 cubic kilometers of contaminated ice was cut out at the accident site, and the excavation was backfilled with tons of sand. At the same time, an investigation into the causes of the crash was underway. It turned out that the reserve pilot, Captain Alfred Diamario, had thrown three foam cushions on the ventilation grate of the heating system under the navigator's chair on the lower deck of Strata Fortress. A minor malfunction in the temperature switch caused the hot air from the engines to barely cool on its way into the cockpit and ignited the cushions. The crew smelled burning rubber, but did not immediately find its source. When they found it, it was too late. The flames flared up and a dozen fire extinguishers were not enough to contain the fire. Soon there was no power and the cabin was filled with smoke. The commander gave the order to leave the car and the plane went down. The bomb's uranium core was twice attempted to be retrieved from the bottom of the bay. In August 1968, the manned vehicle Star 3 was used to do this, but the depth, weather and location of the wreckage made the ascent impossible. Operation Chrome Dome was scrapped and never resumed. What happened next? Immediately after the disaster, the U.S. stopped flying its bombers with nuclear weapons on board. From then on, ballistic missiles became the main carrier of American nuclear weapons. In order to avoid future dispersal of nuclear materials in similar accidents, the U.S. developed low-impact sensitive explosives. In 1995, the U.S. declassified documents showing that, Contrary to its claims, the Danish government did not object to be 52 flights with hydrogen bombs over Greenland. Moreover, nuclear weapons were stored at the Thule Air Base until 1965. In 1995, a survey of Danish cleanup workers found that they were 50% more likely to get cancer than the national average. The government paid each $7,500 in compensation. As of 2013, 78 of the 744 B-52 strategic bombers built remained in service in the U.S. Air Force. Nuclear weapons are available for them, but there are no flights with them. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.